Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pioneering Pensions. For you who don't know me, my name is Stefan Lundberg, and I have a passion for pensions. Today's guest probably don't need an introduction. It's Richard Thaler. He wrote the book Nudge that we practitioners have used and abused uh, thinking about pensions. He's also a Nobel laureate, and he's the professor at Chicago Booth Business School. So with that introduction, I wish you welcome, Richard. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, it's good to see you again. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, before we start, I just want to give a little hint to the audience. Um, we're here for you, and we're going to have a nice conversation around pension and how to use behavioral in it. During that, you can type down your questions to Richard in the, in the comment or in the chat. And then we'll go through that. So half the presentation, half is a conversation and the other half is the time for your questions. So please take the opportunity and ask Richard your questions because this is a new, unique opportunity for you. So with that, I'm going to ask my first question to you, Richard. And I remember that, you know, we worked on something a couple of years ago up in Sweden and that resulted in a paper by you, Kronqvist and you. And the whole idea was how long does a nudge last? And you had some amazing data to look into it. So my question is, how long does a nudge last? The answer to that question is the usual, it depends. Uh, but you're right, we had a unique data set. Uh, you know, economists are very attracted to doing research in Scandinavia now because um, uh, Scandinavians seem to not be obsessed with uh, privacy the way uh, America is. So uh, we had data on the decisions of every Swede since the launch of uh, partial privatization of the social security system that was started back in 2000. And um, when the launch, so the, the, the first paper Kronkvist and I wrote together we called it the battle of the nudges because the program was launched and there was a default fund. Uh, people had no choice, they had to participate, but there was a default fund and you might think lots of people would choose that, but there was also an enormous advertising campaign uh, saying, don't take the default, pick your own. And there were 500 plus funds to choose from. So the question was, what won? The nudging by the advertising, both the government and the funds were advertising, and uh, or the default. And it turns out the advertising won. So about two thirds of the people formed their own portfolios, and about one third uh, took the default. But then, the next year, and every subsequent year, new people came into the system, either young people who got their first job or immigrants. And um, the ads stopped. And pretty quickly, about 90% of the people were taking the default. And um, now it's 98%. Hardly anyone is doing anything else. Uh, so th th that's, that was lesson one, which is, do defaults work? Yes, but it depends on the context. If you have a default, but you try to convince people not to do it, uh, it's not, not clear what will happen. The question of how long they last is, is well, for Swedes in this situation, I remember I gave a presentation where I said, we cannot reject the hypothesis that everyone in Sweden is asleep. Um, and there were two tests of that. One is the default fund at some point decided to add leverage and a lot of leverage. So they were borrowing money and you you had a, essentially 150% in equities if you took the default. Now that's a pretty big shift. And you might think, oh, well, people will switch out of that, especially since 
there was an identical fund without leverage. But approximately no one did. On, on the order of a few hundred people noticed this out of millions. And the, the, the other test of whether people were awake was there was a fund that was caught committing fraud. It was on the front page of every Swedish newspaper. And the people who were invested in that fund didn't seem to notice. So um, at least the participants in this fund have a, are basically on set it or forget it. Set it and forget it. They're, they're just not paying attention. And we see similar behavior in, in lots of defined contribution plans. People choose a portfolio and then they forget about it. So Richard, you're saying Swedes are probably not unusually naive. It's something that is you see in most different countries. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's certainly not that the Swedes are unusual. The situation, each situation is different. So, for example, the fact that only a third of the people took the default, um, that's unusual, but that was in that context. And so you never want to say it's always going to work this way. But as a rule, people are 90 plus percent of the participants are doing nothing. And if you look at the trading, it's, it's by a small minority uh, who think they're geniuses. And when when we design systems for members, uh, we typically have some rational arguments that everybody's looking at the risk return and you take your risk profile into account, et cetera. And what we see in the data is people don't. So probably it's a good idea to rethink how we actually design it and do it so it actually work the way people behave. Yeah, you know, it's a, it, there are unintended consequences to all design choices. And so, for example, when creating this system, the designers decided they weren't going to pick and choose which funds would be admitted. They would let any fund enter if they had passed some test uh, by the EU. So if they were qualified and opted in, then they're in. That got them 500 and some funds. Now, I don't think anybody would have started out saying the right number of funds is 500. And, and it gradually went up over 1,000. But the idea of delegating the decision about what to let in and out, that seems reasonable. So, yes, we, we have to design the system for the people that are going to use it. And no, they are, they're not going to be sophisticated maximizers. You know, there's this old quote I love of Harry Markowitz, who, uh, you know, was the offend, inventor of modern portfolio theory. And he was quoted as saying, that in his retirement plan, he could have solved for the right allocation, but instead he allocated his portfolio 50-50 between stocks and bonds. So, you know, uh, essentially no one is optimizing. Yeah, I think that's a valuable input for people who are designing systems. When I was thinking about choice design as well, we always say like, if you ask any one of us practitioner, we all say, well, it's good to have a choice architecture with a default, but when it comes to say, what should that default look like? It's not as clear answer you get back. And actually who should be the one setting the default? It's not totally clear either. What are your opinions in, in this kind of question? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think these are fair and hard questions. Um, and sometimes these questions are asked with a very critical ring, like, who are you to say what the default should be? And God knows you wouldn't want my co-author, Cass Sunstein, designing the default investment product, since whenever the market 
gets volatile, he calls me up and says, so I should sell everything, right? So uh, our, our argument is that in most organizations, there's somebody, the CFO, the treasurer, who knows more about investing than 99% of the participants. And it's probably not unreasonable to have that person choosing a default investment strategy. And it, it shouldn't be radical. So things like low cost target date funds seem to me to be perfectly reasonable. We can argue about what the glide path should be and um, what, what the investment choices should be, but it's gonna be better than what people do on their own. If we go back to the Sweden example, the, after the default, the fund that got the largest market share was unsurprisingly, the fund that had the highest return over the last five years, because the government conveniently gave people a little booklet that listed five-year returns for each fund. And somebody who went through and picked it, found that, and it got about 5% market share, which is quite remarkable with 500 competitors. So uh, needless to say, it was a risky option. Yeah. And Another part when you think about choice architecture is, I think you wrote in your paper that you think a Swede in the system was a bit like an object in outer space. You nudge it in one direction, it's just continue until it's nudged in another direction. And I think that's a good description, but that also comes with a question, should you ask people to confirm the choices of a certain time? Is there sort of a, how long is the choice valid? In the UK for auto-enrollment, if you decide you don't want to be part of auto-enrollment, after three years, you'll be re-enrolled unless you say you don't want to. So there you have a sort of mechanism every three years, you need to confirm that you don't want to be part of it. But when it comes to the investment decisions people make in pension schemes, uh, we typically don't have any sort of that you need to reselect your funds after a while. What is your opinion on that from a sort of choice architecture design? Is sort of reselection a very good tool or is it you know something we shouldn't use well certainly i agree with the uk strategy of asking again the people who opted out because people could have very good reasons for opting out when they're young maybe they have debts to pay off or whatever and uh so asking every few years are you sure you don't want to be participating? Uh, that seems quite right. Um, it, if you've picked something like a target date fund, uh, then I don't see any very important reason to ask people every few years if they want to switch. Perhaps if they haven't taken the default, and they have a very unbalanced portfolio. They've put it all into Swedish tech stocks. Um, then maybe it would make sense to say, do you want to think this again? And even give them a prompt. Um, your portfolio uh, is quite concentrated and risky. Um, would you like to think about diversifying more? When I'm thinking about, I mean, I'm a practitioner, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out solutions. And I had heated discussions with a lot of people, how much choice should you have? Some are very paternalistic and saying there should be a default, but actually no other choice. You don't need it. No one uses it, so why bother? And then you have those from the other side who say, well, let's open up for as much choice as possible. And I know that you've been a trustee in a pension scheme and you had this debate with one of your trustee colleagues, how much choice should you sort of give members? And what, what were your sort of rationale to, to come to the conclusion you came to? And can you tell so, us a little bit about it? Yeah, so the, the, uh, my colleague was another behavioral economist and we agreed like on 99% level. So we had a good default and then we had a small number of alternative uh, balanced fund choices. And uh, where, where we disagreed was, should there be an option 
to allow people even more choices. And I had a, I said, yes, because hardly anyone is going to use it. And my friend said, no, because hardly anyone is going to use it. We both agreed that those who use it probably wouldn't benefit. So I can see his argument. Um, in the end, we offered it and no one has used it. But um, so, uh, you know, I think certainly what I argued for in the, in the Swedish case was this hierarchy, a default and then a second level, a small number of alternatives. And then you have to at least click twice before you get to the 500 options. And, uh, but reasonable people can disagree about these things. Yeah, and I think the advantage with the design is we're all different and some people might actually really want to do it themselves and allowing them to do it, even if they might not do a great job, might give them some happiness as well. We make all choices in life. Some are good and some are bad. Exactly. I was, I was thinking when when we have things like auto enrollment and um, we make it sort of we want people to sign up as an industry and, and as, as policymakers. And then, of course, we're going to make it a bit difficult for people to to get out. So we have a tendency to say, well, if you want to opt out, you're going to have to fill in a very tedious paper format or you're hitting the doubt button somewhere further down on the website. So I remember from your book, you call that sludge in, uh, at, you know, when you make nudges difficult. So what was your opinion on that? Um, what are the impact of all the sludge we see on the nudges? Yeah, well, as we discovered the other day when we were trying out whatever the interface is that we're using for this conversation, the they, they seem not to get the memo because the button to start it was almost invisible. <laughs> you know, so uh, designers make the on button very bright and clear. Um, you know, the, there are examples of sludge that I find very annoying and I think should almost be illegal. So many um, news offerings make it very easy to join with one click, but to unsubscribe, you have to call. Um, uh, if you subscribe to something in the US, here's a trick. If you want to unsubscribe, change your address to California, and all of a sudden, an unsubscribe button appears because they've made it illegal to do this. Um, so, you know, when I, t I teach MBA students, and I tell them, I don't think this is a way to run a business. It, it, Yes, you'll make some more money, but I, I think you should compete by uh, offering a better newspaper, not by figuring out ways to lock people in. And there's all kinds of versions of sludge and um, from annoying user experiences to uh, quietly locking people in. Uh, and I think that's bad. Now, Making it a little harder to find the riskiest set of options, I don't view that as sludge. Um, you know, I view that as almost like a warning label, uh, but it's not preventing anyone from getting there. I remember Nick Barr, he said, you have to sign in blood in order to enter the self-select place. I think it was yeah. a nice analogy, but you have to confirm you know what you're doing. And then if you do something well, it's, you're responsible. And I think most right. people will accept that. Uh, you said something uh, when we discussed before that if it's a nudge, it can't be any sludge. And I think that was a nice one because you were talking about the cost of opting out as well. If you give someone a uh, nudge, you end up in here. But if you don't want it, you should make the cost very low for people who doesn't want it. Can, can you tell a bit about that? Because uh, I think it's a very important discussion for the industry. You know, I always sign books nudge for good which is a plea. And if you're trying to 
design a system that is for the benefit of the participants, then you should have the participants in mind. And, um, you know, it's sort of the golden rule. Design the system that you would want to be a participant in, or you would want one of your kids to be a participant in, and uh, that will get you pretty much to the right place. Our previous guest, Steve Webb, who used to be the pension minister in the UK, he has a question for you. But instead of me repeating the question, let's roll the tape and see what Steve had to said. Hi, Richard. My question is, what is the next nudge? So we've enjoyed the benefits of your and other research in auto enrollment. We've got 10 million people saving pretty much for the first time. We've enrolled them. We've got them up to 8% and we've been stuck for five years. So I'd be interested in where, given that this has worked and we've kind of stopped now, what would be your next round of nudges or defaults or behavioral framing of, of the, and, and I think that's both for the employee. So, you know, do we do auto escalation of some sort? And it's for the politicians. Given that the politicians have got stuck, they think that where we've got is pretty good and there's other things that are more important and they just won't focus, you know, the present bias doesn't focus on the fact that 45 year olds are going to be poor when they retire because that's tomorrow's problem so how would you nudge just both the individual worker to save more but how would you nudge the politicians out of their current inertia well it's good to see steve again um it's yeah i think it's a great question and you know i would say certainly well parliament has a lot on its plate these days uh, it, it's certainly a reasonable question to ask whether uh, 8% was the right place to stop the auto escalation. Um, my guess is that it should be a bit higher. Uh, again, uh, you, could, you could keep escalating, uh, but ask people if they want to uh, stop. Uh, I, I think that would be a reasonable step. But uh, my real answer to this question is the next big thing is decumulation. So all across the industry, we have these DC plans and they replaced the old style pension, which gave people an annuity. And people really like those. Um, but uh, they liked having an annuity, but essentially no one buys an annuity. It's it, it's a uh, it's a puzzle. Um, my co-author uh, Shlomo Benarsi wrote a paper about this called the annuity puzzle. Um, that no, people love them when they have them, but never buy one. But I I think handing people a pot of money and saying, go enjoy the rest of your lifetime is not very helpful. And I, it's not that I have a pat answer, um, though to the extent that you can give people the equivalent of an allowance. So if you think about somebody who has lived a responsible work life and has managed to save some money has more or less learned the rule, don't spend more than you make. Uh, you know, maybe they borrowed to buy a home or a car, but they lived within their means. Uh, but then when you retire, all of a sudden you have this big pot of money and you may have something coming in from social security or the equivalent, but it's not enough to live on. So you have to spend down this rest. And um, I think the industry uh, is still struggling with that. I'm, I'm going to a conference on this topic next week. Um, and I don't think anyone has the answer, um, but, I think part of the answer 
involves what I call mental accounting, which is giving people, uh, people putting labels on pots of money. Uh, my father was an actuary, so very sophisticated. But he once complained to me sometime when he was in his 80s that he was spending more than he was earning. And I said, Dad, that's the point. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I told him, as far as I can tell, he had enough money to live to 120. What did he think the odds were? But uh, so if someone as sophisticated as that can struggle with these things, uh, I, I think um, that can help. Now, the, the problem is people who are wealthy enough to have financial advisors, may, if they have enough money, they don't need one. Um, and so there's this middle, middle, the middle of the affluent sector that is wealthy enough to have financial advisors, but not so wealthy that they don't really need it. That uh, that's where the market is serving them. Though I still think they haven't figured out exactly what to do. Uh, some things like having a bond ladder. So if, if uh, you, you go to a couple and say, look, the next five years of consumption are guaranteed because we've bought one, two, three, four, and five-year bonds. Uh, so there's no principal risk. And we're going to keep doing this. So when you, when we get through this year, we'll buy another five-year bond. That can be very reassuring. Uh, again, if people have enough money to to be able to fund that. If they're not doing that, uh, some other way of giving people at least a target on how much they should be spending uh, will help. And uh, by the way, I would say lots of people are just spending too little. Uh, there are lots of bequests that at least appear to be accidental. And it's because people are used to being frugal and uh, are reluctant to spend. And uh, that's good for having saved up a pot of money, but um, no point in waiting till you're 100 to spend it. Uh, even the queen didn't make it to 100. And I think that's an important comment that if you have enough money, pooling individual longevity risk could be a good idea because then even if it's not a fixed annuity, it's a variable version of it, at least you know you're going to have an income for as long as you live. And if you die, well, you might not need the money. So I think it's a, a good approach. One, one question for me is that I'm going back to saying I like your approach of the bond ladder because it sort of makes it easy to explain to someone. You can tell someone this is what it is. Here's your safe asset. Here's your risk assets, and and you you get some sort of adapt adaptive possible to change if things are not going as you wanted. But when I talk to some people, you know, a lot of the my industry colleagues are very technical and they want to build a really complicated solution, you know, with buffers and intergenerational risk sharing, all that kind of stuff. So o only a few people can really understand it. So I think, what would you say if you want to solve this problem? Is it to focus on making things understandable to the end consumer or trying to make a technical, very good solution, but which is difficult to explain? Look, I think it, it can be a mixture of those. So, Look, a target date fund, most people don't know exactly what the glide path is. But they, they know that there's something going on that is uh, rebalancing automatically uh, and reducing risk over time. But almost no one will know the details of that. Uh, but I, I think a, a very complicated plan uh, is unlikely to be the right solution now and even even the bond ladder it's not important that people know what a bond ladder is it, it's not there's no ladder yeah. uh, uh, well if if what they know is look 
uh, we have your daily consumption needs taken care of and we're investing some other money for growth and maybe um, to increase your consumption later or to give it give it away or what have you, that's probably all they need to know. The solution is making things understandable. And I think as a pension industry, we made it unnecessarily complicated. So with that, I would like to turn to the audience questions. So Richard, the first question comes from David Bird. He says, in the UK, we have a similar high use of default funds as you described in Sweden. With that background, and given the attention paid by sponsor and trustees to the default, why allow members the opportunity to choose and potentially mess it up for themselves? Well, right, this is what we were talking about earlier, and I, I, there's an argument to be made for that. Uh, on the other hand, there can be situations where people have legitimate reasons to do something other than the default. So, you know, uh, I have uh, an interest in a money management firm that invests in US small cap equities. So if I were devising my own retirement plan, I would wanna underweight US small cap equities, not because I think they're bad investments, but because I already have a big explicit and implicit investment in that. So similarly, you know, if you work in the automobile industry, uh, maybe you want to underweight that relative to other things. Um, and somebody who's sophisticated enough to figure that out and wants to go, go their own way, I, I'm happy to let them do that. I don't think very many people will. And it's my friend was probably right that those who do may mess it up. So I, I don't think there's a right or wrong here. Uh, but but giving people a little more freedom, if there's a little bit of sludge to slow them down on the way, probably won't cause much harm. Thank you, Richard. And the next question comes from John Mitchum. Does Dr. Taller think that private market assets, less liquid, but arguably better aligned with long-term savings, should be introduced into DC plans? There are very practical questions about how you would go about doing that. So who's going to choose the, uh, the funds and what fees are they going to get paid? And and whether things will be marked to market. So, you know, private equity can give the illusion of no volatility because their investments um, haven't hit the market. So uh, I, I, I think it would be hard to implement. Um, I seem to remember that the original Swedish default fund had a little of that in there, uh, or at least some hedge funds. Um, personally, I, I wouldn't bother. Um, the, uh, I, it, it wouldn't be a big enough portion of the portfolio to really make a difference. And I, I see lots of uh, opportunity for uh, bad behavior. Uh, so... Uh, I probably wouldn't do it. Thank you, Richard. And here's a question from Bernard Casey. What do you think not only about nudging people into pension, but also nudging them into not to drop out once they're in? There are some suggestions that has been happening recently. Moreover, when people change the job, they often have to join a different plan. What is the role of nudging in a world of multiple small pots? The German Reister plan avoids this. So the question there, I think, is a bit like um, you you have this problem when people shift around and forget about their savings. Right. It kind of floats around and you're sort of don't managing it. What, what do you think is the right approach there to solve it? Yeah, so 
uh, the U.S. is particularly bad on this front. So somebody joins a plan and then they ch they leave after a year and they have a small pot of money. They're very likely to cash it out. There was a rule passed a few years ago that if there's more than X dollars, I think it may be 5,000, then the default has to be to roll it into another retirement plan. But you, they can, they may cash that out. Um, I, I think there should be one plan that that people um, get rolled into, and if they keep switching jobs, um, that that will stay. The you know def defined contribution retirement plans. As far as I know, we're pretty much invented in the U.S. academic market. T.I. Kreff was a very early provider. And the idea was if you lost your job at University A and moved to University B, the, you wouldn't, that money would flow with you. And that's the system that we would like. And each country has a different version of this problem, but... but the default should be that the money stays in a retirement fund and that there just be one of them. I, I remember years ago when in the UK um, they made this option that you could take some money out. And I was asking people, how easy is it to find what funds you have? And the answer was not very easy. So if, if you can't even find out what you have uh, by plugging in your the equivalent of a social security number and having it pop up on the screen, then that's a major design flaw. Yeah, that, I fully agree with you. And in the UK, they actually are working on something called a pension dashboard where you should be able to find your pension. But yeah. in many other countries, it's already up and running. And I think UK is a laggard here, but at least they're moving in that direction, which is a good thing. Yeah. And these conversations I was having were was eight years ago. Yeah. When I was saying, you know, you really should be working on something like this. So I'm glad to hear they are working on it. You can say with some of these projects, it's, it's quite complicated to get everything to work and to make life even more difficult in the UK. They don't have a social security number that is unique for the individual, like you have in most other countries, which makes it really difficult to find who is really who. So yeah. that is a tip too for someone in the UK government, please introduce a social security number that is unique. Henry Tapper has a question for you. He says, one thing that defeats a default is conviction if groups of people refuse to invest in fossil fuels or want to invest according to Sharia laws, then they will demand their own fund. Do Swede have no convictions? Was his question. <laughs> yeah, I, look, the, the whole, this whole topic deserves its own podcast um, because, we, you know, Socially responsible investing, um, whatever you want to call it, um, everybody has their own version of what it ought to be. Uh, and providing that option, there won't be a single option that will please everyone. Um, so I, I'm going to just duck that question because I don't know how to do it. I think Swede, I mean, I'm a Swede, so I can say something about what the Swedes think. I, I think Swedes are probably not that engaged in the pension in the first place. They think, well, it's taken care of and the government has kind of appointed a default fund and it's probably good in my minute. So I think a lot of us might have convictions, but pension is not on top of the list. When you want to work on those convictions, you probably kind of do something at home or change your habits or change what you eat. You might not think of pensions in the first place. Well, and it's also the case that the 
the part that we've been talking about, the privatization part, is a small portion of a very generous social security system. And so they're right not to worry about it very much. Yes. And I think you have a good point there that any pension system, when you look at it, it's the, the state has a social security system and pension is on top of that and need to cover the, the holes left by the government. And some governments leave more holes than others in the social security system. Right. Damon Stancomb has a question. When do nudges become unethical or are they always the right way to influence choice? As a tool, not kind of, you can do unethical nudges in directions, but is it as a tool unethical? Well, I don't, I don't think we can uh, make a generalization. Um, that's what, you know, when I say nudge for good, that's a plea. Now, obviously, if um, somebody designs a, a, a scheme that puts the fund they manage or their brother-in-law manages into the default fund, that's clearly unethical. Um, it's, it's less clear, you know, the, the designers will neither be geniuses nor omniscient. And so their choices won't be perfect. You know, my usual argument is they won't be perfect, but they'll be better than on average the choices individuals will have made. And if that's not true, then they did a lousy job. And uh, so, but that's a pretty low bar to get over. So, uh, you know, uh, having automatic enrollment and automatic escalation and making the default have some automatic rebalancing, I would say these are essential parts of any defined contribution plan. Thank you, Richard. I think it was a good answer. And Mark Stoppard has a question. And the background for that, is there's something in the UK called Pension Wise, which is funded by the government. Anyone can call them and ask about pensions and get, uh, say, you cannot get advice, but you can get guidance. Uh, and Mark asks, why do you think we are not having more luck nudging or even stronger nudging people to take up the excellent free retirement guidance service available in the UK from Pension Wise? So it's there. We tell people, go and check it out. The whole industry does that. Very few picks it up. What do you think we can do? Maybe gamify it. You know, look, Bill Sharp, William Sharp, uh, early Nobel laureate for his research in, uh, to uh, financial economics, started a company called Financial Engines. And it was offering advice to people on how much they should save and how to invest it. And some companies made that available free to their employees. And to a first approximation, no one ever used it. So, and the reason is, it was, there was a lot of sludge. So, you know, think about it. Uh, if I'm going to do this uh, for you, I'm, I need to know what other pensions you have. I better know what benefits you're going to get because you're a Swedish citizen. Is your wife working? Does she have a pension plan? Do you own a home? If so, do you have a mortgage? You can see uh, most people are going to stop 15 minutes into this because, you know, they don't remember the login to their mortgage and they have no idea what their home is worth and, oh, it's too much of a headache. So uh, unless all the... Unless all the data is in one convenient place, people are going to very find it very hard to use that. And as we know from our previous discussion, even finding out what pensions you have in the UK is hard. 
Yeah, and I think I fully agree with you. And I think if you're going to be successful building a solution, actually getting all the data in one place without having to bother, it's a good thing. And I, I, I believe that with some new fintechs coming on board and the new sort of technology, we might be able to see something like that into the future. Not unless they take up your idea of having a social security number. Yeah, at least in the UK, but in other countries, right. it might be quicker. <laughs> uh, there is a question here from Adrian Balding. He said, Richard, of the 400,000 annuities bought in the UK by individuals each year, 90% are level with no prospect of any increases throughout the member's retirement. So basically nominal annuities that doesn't grow over time. Is there a way that we can nudge people to make some provision for cost of living increases as prices will clearly go up substantially during a 25 year retirement period? Yeah, well, how, of course, offering real annuities, um, I mean, it would be smart for people to buy such things. Um, the, the industry may be reluctant to offer them um, because it, it's hard enough to deal with longevity risk. So if all of a sudden we have a cure for cancer and life expectancy goes up by three years, uh, all annuity offerings are in big trouble. And if we add to that an inflation adjustment, uh, well, the people selling those right now would be mighty worried. So um, in the yep. U.S., uh, there, is, there is one source for an indexed annuity, and that's Social Security. And I have proposed that we allow people to buy to essentially invest in buying more social security benefits, which they can already do because you can decide when to claim. You can claim as early as 62 and as late as 70. If you wait until 70, your benefits, something like double, I don't remember the exact amount. So uh, that's like buying more, right, by waiting. and. By limiting it at some number like a quarter of a million, uh, I don't think it's really taking that much profitable business away from the private sector. And the private sector doesn't seem that interested um, in offering real annuities anyway. So th that's a, a US centric uh, a solution, but I think it's one that, that others might consider. And I think it can also mean you start working part-time uh, during retirement and therefore draw down much less and therefore postpone it a bit. So I think- Absolutely. Yeah. There's another question from David Bird and he says, thinking about optimization in post-retirement for DC plans, is it better to optimize the investment solution or the member experience so that the member knows what they have and what they will get? Or is this a false trade-off? So I think it comes back to the question on should you trying to, you know, have a technical, really clever model that's going to return superior returns, or should you make it understandable to to the member in your design? You know, I'm not sure that. I think the solution can be highly technical and not transparent uh, if it's doing its job, and. And there are small things that economists wouldn't think are very important. So, for example, um, the, I logged into uh, the website of a large financial services company that has a big pot of my money. And the thing I see in the middle of the screen is the change in my net worth today. Now, who thought that was a good idea? And, you know, I think um, getting rid of that, uh, I, I figured out a way to do it myself. 
Um, but uh, thinking about calming people down and I don't, I mean, if you can have a lot of financial engineering that goes into uh, moving the fish and frontier out, go for it. And you don't need to explain to all the participants what you're doing, but you better explain it to the regulator and the regulator better have people who are capable of understanding it, which won't always be the case. Yeah, I can see that challenge. Uh, Catherine Donnelly has a question. Is it reasonable for retired older people to be expected to make investment decisions on an ongoing basis? Also, information asymmetries are high between retirees and the financial service industry and a huge scope for individuals being sold a very bad deal. Yeah, I, look, I think what I've been saying is people like to set it and forget it. We should figure out a way for them to do that uh, and still have a good retirement. And yeah. so the answer is no. Uh, we shouldn't be asking uh, the elderly to be portfolio managers. Uh, we should take care of it. For that matter. Yeah, I think it boils down to the agency issue. Who, who is the one who's going to look after the member? And I think in the UK, we have a trustee system where the trustees have the obligation to look at it. And I think there you can probably work with it. If it's your pure, purely sort of commercial setting, it might be much more difficult. So there was a, another question here from Chris Dreg, Chris Degg. What is your view on trustees of DC funds suggesting IFAs to members and then paying for the advice? So the whole idea that the trustees do some sort of procurement of independent financial advisors, recommend it to the member and, and pick up the cost. So the member doesn't have to pay the, for the advice. What's your thought around that as a, as a model? You know, I, I think um, in principle, um, I think that's fine. Um, and, you know, so for example, uh, at my employer, the University of Chicago, uh, when you're considering retirement, they offer some services on how to help you think about whether you've got enough saved up. And um, I, I think um, it, it ought to be that a, at least a primitive version of that uh, through fintech, making that available uh, as long as it has been vetted, uh, then I think it's a great idea. And also when I'm thinking, my take on this is that if you are a high income owner, you can afford it and you're going to find it, as you said earlier, Richard, I think it's sort of the middle layer where you are not earning that much. You don't have such a big pot. It's actually worth going to an advisor, but then you need products, which basically is, uh, does what it says on the tin, right? So you, you, you basically can pick a couple of things to get what you want. Yeah, and you know, in the in the UK system that we were referring to earlier, um, certainly sending people a reminder and a prompt that look, uh, you're 55 and you only have X here, maybe you should increase the amount you're contributing. Uh, that would make total sense to me. Thank you, Richard. I think that's the last question we could take from the audience. But you've been now ask, been answering a lot of the question. So perhaps it would be a good idea for you to ask a question. And the next speaker is your friend, Larry Kotlikoff. So what question would you like to ask him? OK, Larry, and I, I think we may have discussed this at least via email. But uh, earlier in this show, I mentioned an idea I have which is allowing people to essentially buy more social security benefits, the equivalent of delaying claiming uh, at some actuarially fair rate 
with a cap on the order of magnitude of a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, there, it's very difficult to buy a reasonably priced real annuity. Um, Social Security offers one. What do you think of that idea? Thank you, Richard. That was a very good question for, for Larry. Um, I would like to thank everyone who's been in this webinar and listening in, and particularly everyone who asked questions. I hope some of, of your questions were addressed and that you can actually take this and, and see what we can do to make pensions work better in practice. And I would like to give a big thank you to you also, Richard, for participating in Pioneering Pension. It's been a pleasure to have you here. And uh, well, with that, I, I would wish everybody to have a great day or a great night, depending on where you are.